Welcome to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Nicholson, crime scene investigator turned functional health investigator. This podcast is here to share bite-sized episodes and unique interviews on a wide variety of health topics to empower, enlighten, and educate you to live your best, most vibrant life. Disclaimer, all information you hear on this podcast is for information only and constitutes individual opinions of the person speaking. This should not be taken as medical advice. Being a listener of this show does not initiate a practitioner-client relationship between you and the hosts or panelists on this show. Please discuss these topics with your medical professionals before making any changes to your health. Okay, let's dive in. Welcome back to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. Today, we're going to have an interesting conversation around postpartum health and specifically how that relates to metabolic health. I am joined with special guest, Dr. Brandy Cummings. Thank you so much for joining, Brandy. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here. This is going to be a fun conversation for anyone who's ever had children and kind of felt like things just were never the same again. I think that's such a brilliant way to say it, that you hear that all the time from your clients. So why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about you and quick introduction. Okay, great. So I came into this space like most people with a personal kind of health journey. And I had a two year stint of my life with extremely debilitating mold illness. Um, at that point, I was already in the health world. I had, I had um, just opened my practice actually. And that period of time where I was really struggling with that mold illness was just really one of the lowest, darkest points in my life. And I also, you know, suffered a miscarriage during that time. And so I really had to completely pivot my whole life. I had to quit my job and find the right practitioners. And I was able to overcome that and um, went on to have, you know, beautiful, healthy babies. And so I was also, while during that period, I was working on my master's degree. And when I graduated and I was starting to feel better, I was like, I have to, this is what I have to do. So I really pivoted everything about my practice and really went into this, you know, environmental med piece. And then, you know, after my experience of having my daughter and just being so aware of the massive gaps in support that there are in care for a person during that time, I really married the two together and um, it's been working out great. Primarily now I work a lot with uh, postpartum women, you know, even if they gave birth 10 plus years ago, because postpartum is forever, right? That act of becoming a, a parent, a mother really changes us forever. And so just like you said, what I hear a lot is that things were never the same ever since I gave birth, right? It's really that catalyst or trigger for a cascade of symptoms. So that is primarily who I um, focus on helping now. And I just love it. Oh, that's such a unique specialty and definitely not one that I've heard anyone else focus on. So I think that's brilliant. <laughs> Um, I want to dive in a little bit. We'll obviously get to the whole pregnancy and postpartum situation, but I want to talk just briefly about the mold picture. Like, how did you figure that out? Was it your moldy house? Like, how did that whole thing transpire that you even figured out that mold illness was going on? It was a really long road. I mean, like I said, I was really sick for two years. Um, I saw a lot of specialists and doctors and I wasn't getting any answers and I went to a new naturopath and she kind of got me somewhat better. At least I was functioning, but I was just like, gosh, something is missing. Um, and I, I knew I was exposed to mold at my job. Um, there was a lot of black mold in the basement of that building. It was like a historic hundred plus year old building. And that also correlated with when my symptoms started of when I started working there. So I knew that that was the, place of exposure. And then I, um, I just kept digging and I found the right practitioner and we did the right testing and, you know, he put me on a protocol and, you know, it doesn't happen like this for everybody, but for me, God, it was just like a light switch flipped everything. I was just like, Oh my gosh, for the first time in two years, I was like, this doesn't have to be my life. Like I am going to get better. And like I said, it was really a dark time in my life. I was 
I, I honestly got to the point where I was like, I have to get better or like, I need to die. Like, I that sounds so extreme now, but at the time I was just like, those are my only two options because I can't do this. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think about him, that practitioner that really helped me all the time. Um, uh, he actually lives in Texas. I'm going to be in Texas next week. I was like, I should email him. Maybe we could get together. But, you know, I really feel like he saved my life and just having the right people on your team. And then from there, I just got better and better and better. And then I got pregnant with my first daughter. And so I kind of have to pivot my approach. You know, we don't want to do a lot of heavy duty detoxification during pregnancy. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a great story. And, you know, I think so many people maybe don't have that, like they know there's mold there, they can see it, they're, they're you know, they're aware of that piece. So many t- people just suffer with this kind of mysterious illness and they never really are able to connect it until either that mold is discovered and they're like, oh, this could be part of it. Yeah. Or they go see the right kind of practitioner who does this sort of testing and tells them you've got a mold problem. So I think that's really interesting that you kind of knew that that's what it was. And yet it still took, you know, the right specialists to really help you dig out of that. Yeah, totally. So, okay. So now let's turn into more of the pregnancy and postpartum situation. So, um, you get pregnant, you have to back off on some of the protocol stuff, because like you said, we don't want to be doing those things during pregnancy and be, you know, circulating all of these toxins that now can go directly into this developing baby. So, you know, what did that look like? What, what did you have to, you know, do throughout your pregnancy, knowing that this is something that you already had, you know, inside of you that you were dealing with, you know, what did you have to do differently than maybe someone who didn't have this known thing that they were already working on? Well, the really great thing for me is that at that point I was feeling so good. You know, I was feeling just full of vitality and I was feeling robust and strong and like I had good nutrient reserves, you know. Um, And so, you know, I backed off of some of the things that I was doing, you know, like before I was in my sauna every day, you know, I wasn't getting into a really hot sauna anymore, you know, Um, I wasn't taking certain supplements anymore. But I just really kind of continued on because I was feeling so good. So I just kind of cut the stuff out that could be potentially dangerous and kept going with my nutrition plan. And it I really feel like it helped me have a pretty insignificant pregnancy as far as like health concerns, you know, um, when I mentioned earlier about being becoming aware of the gaps in support, I feel like um, that experience really came from just the providers that I had on my team. It wasn't really from symptoms that I was having. And I actually switched my whole birth care team halfway through my pregnancy because I was just, I just felt like something wasn't a good fit. Something wasn't right. And, you know, got with people that were more in alignment And then after giving birth, um, you know, it's an interesting piece of my story because I didn't want to pick back up any of the, you know, heavy duty detoxification while I was nursing. And then that child nursed until she was almost three. So it was a really long time. And then it was only like, I think, seven months later before I got pregnant again. And... That baby is just about 15 months old and she just stopped nursing. So this is such a timely conversation because for the first time in literally over six years, I feel like I can finally kind of get back to it. So I myself am, you know, doing testing on myself and kind of putting myself through some new protocols just to kind of close that circle and make sure, you know, I'm where I need to be for longevity's sake. Awesome. So obviously you got out of the moldy environment. So you kind of took that piece away. Oh yeah. That was really scary. I quit my job. We were not in a financial situation for me to be able to do that, but there was no choice in my mind. It was literally life and death. Yeah. And we went into a whole bunch of debt, you know, fight, you know, paying practitioners and buy, you know, the sauna and things that we needed. And it was really scary to do that, but Gosh, 
I'm glad I did. Not that I want people to go into debt, but for us at the time, it was the right thing to do so that I could get over that hump. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your health is priceless. So, yeah, you know, unfortunately that sometimes means leaving jobs, leaving houses, you know, spending a lot of money. This stuff can be pricey and yeah. because it's so specialized and it's so important, unfortunately it just comes with a price tag, but you can't put a price on your health. So I agree with you. I think a lot of people, you know, would do what they had to do to get through that situation, knowing that, you know, the financial burden is temporary. It's a yeah. big burden in some cases, but it's temporary and you can always get back out of that, but you can't get your health back and you can't get your life back if you miss, you know, decades of it being sick. So I absolutely. Agree. I never would have been able to build up my practice or go back, and get my doctorate degree. None of that, you know, yeah. so it was yeah. a good investment. <laughs> Yeah. So talk a little bit about the original birth team that you got rid of. What kinds of stuff just felt like it wasn't in alignment? Was it just that you didn't agree with the advice that they were giving? Were they just not giving much at all? What was the story there? Uh, the first thing is that, you know, I got pregnant again and they told me to come back at like 11 weeks. And I was just so taken aback by that. I was like, no, 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 no. I have like been really sick. I've been chronically ill. I like have had a miscarriage. Like I need, excuse me, earlier help. Like, what do you mean come back in like almost trimester two? What? And I was so shocked. And I, you know, because of my own education, I was just thinking like about all the neurodevelopment happening at that time. And I was, I just felt really unsupported and like, because I just wanted to do all the things I could. And that was the first thing. And then to learn that that's really normal and standard of care. Um, you know, since the pandemic, the um, they have brought that date earlier, up earlier, which I think is an improvement. I think they did that in response to how many telehealth visits were happening during the pandemic. So that was a one positive, I guess, that came out <laughs> of that time. But yeah, I was just so surprised by that. And then when I would talk about my birth plan and I wanted to I wanted to have a real risk benefit analysis of certain decisions of glucola of a water birth you know and and um what that looked like and what the risks were and I wasn't given the opportunity to have any sort of dialogue it was very much this is the way we do it and that's the only option and that just that didn't feel good so I ended up switching my birth team to a team that was actually not, <clears throat> excuse me, not convenient geographically. It was quite a much bigger commute, but it was such a better fit. And it was a wild to have my first appointment with them. And just the extreme difference was crazy. Yeah. I think that's such a valuable lesson that we all need to learn from because you know, this was a, a pretty clear case for you that you wanted to have these deeper conversations and you wanted to be able to, you know, have a risk benefit conversation and they didn't want anything to do with that. And I think the same thing could happen in any health condition, in any medical visit. If your provider isn't listening to you, isn't answering your questions, isn't open to opportunities or options, Sometimes you just have to cut bait and go find someone else. And I think this is a really valuable lesson that you are in charge of your health and you have to find a team of people that will support you on your journey. It's your body, your life. You get to decide. So I think so many people just go with whatever their doctor tells them and they don't ask the hard questions and they don't push for their own beliefs and preferences and desires and get all their questions answered. I talked to so many people who are like, this is what my doctor said. And I'm like, well, did you ask about why this or that? And they're like, no. <laughs> and yet yeah. they don't like what they're being told. They're just buying it and going with it. And I think we all have to feel a little bit more empowered to ask the hard questions, you know, push for resources or, you know, additional information or whatever that looks like. So I think, you know, that's a really powerful story to say, you know, you have the ability to just up and leave, even if it means a longer drive. Um, yeah, think that, that is so funny because that is almost word for word what I tell my clients. I say, 
This is your body, your life, and your health. You're the pilot. I'm just the co-pilot. I'm honored to be here. I'm here to help you navigate, but you're the pilot and you're calling the shots. Like I say that sentence with every single client. Exactly. Yeah. Cause even with us, even, you know, the, the clients that we work with, yeah, it's still you. We're just here to make recommendations and give you education and resources. We're not here to tell you what to do. There's no judgment. If you decide to go a different direction, Exactly. it's your body, it's your health. It's your journey. You get to decide and that's how it should be. So I don't think any doctors or practitioners of any kind should be offended by questions or by, you know, someone offering a different opportunity or a different, you know, path or, you know, just having the dialogue, I think is so important. And so, uh, yeah, I really would encourage everyone to do exactly what you did and ask those hard questions and be willing to go find someone else if you're not getting the service that you want. Exactly. Yeah. I hear it so often, especially when you go, come back, come back to pregnancy specifically. So many of my friends, their doctors are like, eat whatever you want. You know, you're eating for two. Oh and, my gosh. You know, just all the things that I'm like, no, you do you really want to start your child off by eating, you know, candy and soda and ice cream and just junk food? Is that really the developmental path you want them to start with? Also, it's just such flawed advice because mm-hmm. you really don't need that many more calories, you know, oh, you're a not eating hundred... for two adults. <laughs> no, definitely not. A few, a few hundred, you know, trimester two, maybe 500 trimester three, but not 4,000. You know? Right. Yeah. That's crazy. So yeah, I think we all just need to have that little ability in our minds that no, this is my body. I get to ask questions and I get to say, I don't like the direction you're going and I'm going to go somewhere yeah. else. Totally. I think that's great. So, okay. So you get pregnant, you go through the thing, you switch teams, you find a team that's much more open to all of these discussions and, you know, preferences and things and answers your questions. You figure out what path you're going to take. So what happens then? Well, so then I, my plan was to give birth at the birth center. I labored at the birth center for over 20 hours And I was just getting too tired and I wasn't progressing. And I was, and we made the decision to transfer to the hospital. So I transferred to the hospital and I still, I didn't give birth until many, 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 many hours later. I was able to have a vaginal birth, but I was in active labor for well over 30 hours. Like it was just so long and laborious. And in the hospital, I again had some negative experiences. You know, I was told that, um, well, later I found out that I had fractured my tailbone in childbirth and I kept telling them how much my tailbone was hurting and I needed help to go to the bathroom and sorry, I don't know what is with my throat today. Um, And, you know, I just wasn't getting the support. I was told that breastfeeding had failed. I was told that it was time to switch to formula. Like baby isn't even two days old at this point. And we had to have a billy blanket and it was just not a good experience. And we, we got home, we got discharged and I called a private lactation consultant to come over and she saved our breastfeeding relationship because I just, I don't have anything against using formula, but I just felt like to hear that message when my milk hadn't even came in, I felt like that was a mismatch. I was like, what do you, what? That doesn't make sense. And, um, so she came over, she got us on the right track. And then, like I said, she ended up nursing till she was like almost three. (laughs) Yeah. So obviously it wasn't something you needed to give up on day one or two. Like, right. Yeah. These things take time. And yeah, I think going to a specialist is the right call for a lot of women. Yeah. Okay. So now you're home. Obviously lactation is now working. Baby's doing well. Mom's recovering all the things. So, you know, kind of, is there more to the journey or really not until after the second pregnancy? I did have pretty severe postpartum anxiety, you know, during that time. Um, That was really from a lack of a village, a lack of support, which is something I work on so heavily with my clients. We do not gloss over that. I literally have a worksheet where I'm like, we're writing it down. Who's available? What are their jobs? And 
we are going to figure this out because it really does take a village. Yeah. Um, and everyone's got people they can reach out to. So yeah, we need to be okay with asking for that. And be specific. You know, people mm-hmm. don't know what you need and don't just ask for exactly what you want. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want you to come over. I want you to rotate my laundry, whip through my dishes and bring me something to eat, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, because people don't know. Then then they just come over and want to hold your baby, and then that's not helpful. And right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, not much more to the story after that. And then um, yeah, I got pregnant again. The second pregnancy I felt like was easier. I had a home birth with that pregnancy. Um, and yeah, she she weaned herself like <clears throat> like last month. So just such a different kid. Yeah. I think that's so common. And do you find that that's often the case with the second child that maybe they go through those stages a little bit quicker because they're looking at the older sibling or is it just totally random? I don't know. I mean, I think they do tend to be a little bit more independent, but yeah, so different with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then now you're postpartum twice. What changed after the second pregnancy for you? Um, you know, not, not a lot after pregnancy. Now that baby has weaned, like I said, I'm just now getting back to doing some of those things um, that I was doing before. And so really making sure that I'm supporting drainage pathways and detoxification and addressing any mold that there might be utilizing sauna. I'm just kind of picking up all of those things that you just really can't do. Everything's a little bit on pause. Obviously there's a million things we can do to support our health during pregnancy and breastfeeding. But when we're going down like a toxicity route, route, we're just kind of on pause until baby's done nursing. So just now starting to get back into that. Okay. So what are some of the things that you would say, like you talked about, you know, creating this village around someone who's having a baby or who's had a baby. What are some of the other things that you see that people maybe don't prioritize or don't quite set up right, or just completely miss the mark on have gotten bad advice about like, where are people maybe either not prioritizing or just flat getting it wrong? Well, in the postpartum period, I see a lot of emphasis on weight loss, you know, which I am just, I just feel like that's on the bottom of our priority list right now. We really need to be focused on being nourished, you know, and we were talking prior a little bit about metabolism, you know, and metabolism is inherently increased during pregnancy, but then during postpartum, it's much lower than it was compared to pregnancy. And if we are forgetting to eat or if we're under eating because we have a weight loss goal, that is only going to make the problem worse. And, you know, forgetting to eat is just as common as purposely maybe not eating enough because we're so busy, we're tired, we might not have energy to <clears throat> to make ourselves something to eat. Um, so really focusing on that time being a nourishing time, taking all the time that you can off of work, you know, really maximizing that time and <clears throat> prioritizing just like some, I, I mean, what I, I don't know what I would consider like basic nutritional things. Are you getting enough protein? Are you hydrated? Do you have enough omega threes? You know, like I know that a lot of women will make like lactation cookies, you know, to have on hand. And I think that's great. I had, I did that too, but really focusing on like protein first. Are we getting enough protein? We have to have protein to rebuild tissue. We have to have protein to heal, you know, and going for that protein first, I feel like is going to be so helpful and supportive of our metabolism, right? If we're only surviving off of oat-based lactation cookies, that isn't going to get us there, right? We have to have that protein. We have to have that that really good fat. And then 
making sure that we're eating a lot of warming foods, <clears throat> including warming spices, you know, because those are really supportive of blood sugar and metabolism as well. And not going for like the cold spinach smoothies as much, you know? Yeah. I think that's great advice. And for sure, nutrition, I mean, I can see, I don't, I don't personally have kids, so I can only imagine. And I've heard from friends and family and, you know, patients who've had, um, babies of their own in the struggles in, especially in those early days when you're not sleeping and, you know, people are trying to be helpful and they bring you food, but it's all like Mac and cheese and pizza. And it's all, you know, not super high quality protein filled foods. And so, yeah, I think the nutrition piece is key, especially right afterwards, because like you said, you're healing. You just went through a significant medical event and you have a lot of healing to do. You're also naturally insulin resistant during pregnancy because you're in a stage of growth. It's just like during puberty, you're yeah. growing another human and your body is growing. So you're naturally more insulin resistant, which is increasing your body's ability to gain both in fat and in just tissue in general. And it takes a little while for that to recover. And so we really need that protein for healing. We need it for blood sugar management. We need it for stable energy, for hormone rebalancing, for just all the things. And with that protein, we need the healthy fats. You know, most or a huge chunk of breast milk is fat. Yeah. And so we need those healthy fats far more than we need, you know, the big carbohydrate doses and things that we get from the mac and cheese and things that people bring when yeah. you're, you know, just getting home from the hospital. And so, yeah, I think that's a huge thing. And then I know sleep is such a hard one for people to do when you've got, you know, a, a newborn that's waking up every few hours and that can last for a long time where it's interrupted sleep and just not great quality. But I think you have to do everything you can to get more sleep too. And maybe that's part of the allowing the vill village to help out and take some of those night shifts when they can, or help you take naps during the day or whatever that looks like. Yeah. The sleep is so important and it is such, it is, it's dependent on the village because in a lot of ways, there's not a lot you can do about the sleep, especially in those early days. You know, you're, you're feeding a human, you're taking care of a human, but if you're doing that without a village, it is a million times worse. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing is that the other thing I see a lot is, well, first of all, if we have, like you said, we're naturally more insulin resistant during pregnancy, <clears throat> but if a, um, during pregnancy, we have like gestational diabetes where that insulin resistance is unmanaged and, um, you know, like maybe we have to be on insulin for that, but if we have gestational diabetes and if we look at the literature, having gestational diabetes increases risks of, you know, like metabolic syndrome, like three months postpartum. So the point at which to support your body with good nutrition doesn't start when baby comes. It should, I mean, it, uh, ideally it would start like six months before conception, but you know, I mean, anytime you start is better late than never, but supporting that blood sugar regulation during pregnancy will pay you back in dividends in the postpartum period. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. So what other, you know, do you just have like three tips or, you know, something really quick and actionable that people can do to, you know, improve whether they've just had a baby, whether they're currently pregnant, whether they're trying to get pregnant, maybe they've had miscarriages, like whatever that may be, what are like maybe three things that people can prioritize Oh, such a good question. I know there's um, way more than three. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, you know, if they're postpartum, I really recommend working with somebody that will order a complete thyroid panel. There's so much postpartum autoimmunity that can happen. And this is due to that rapid rebound in hormones. This is due to prolactin being increased. Also, <clears throat> due to microchimerism, which is a mixing of blood between mom and baby. And we see a lot of postpartum autoimmunity, especially Hashimoto's with thyroid. And if we're not looking out for our moms and testing them, then they could be going without treatment, you know? And unfortunately, what I see is a lot of the symptoms such as 
weight gain, moodiness, fatigue, losing their hair. A lot of those symptoms get brushed off as just like welcome to motherhood. But in reality, they have like a full-blown autoimmune condition going on. And so that piece can't be missed. So putting that on your radar to have that testing done after you have your baby, um, not right away, but, you know, several months down the, down the road, just to check in on things to make sure you're doing well. <clears throat> Number two, like I said, identify your village, write it down. Do not breeze over this step. Who are they? What's their phone number? When are they available? And what jobs can they do? That is key. That is so, so key. And then, you know, for preconception, I'm kind of doing one in each in yep. each category here. For preconception, if you have time, meaning time before you conceive, I would really recommend looking into some of these environmental things, you know, really focusing on lowering our total body burden. Where are we having environmental toxic exposures? Do we have a lot of exposure to vehicular exhaust or mold or what kind of health, pro you know, hygiene products or cleaning products are we using? Can we swap those out? Anything we can do to lower that total body burden and maybe start, you know, clearing some of that stuff out. Like if there is an issue with mold, um, because all of everything you do preconception to improve your health does not just benefit you and it does not just benefit your baby, but it benefits your future grandchildren. And when I think about how to turn this ship around, this ship meaning like general unhealthiness as a whole population, in my mind, that's the ultimate in preventative medicine, right? Like let's catch these people two generations before they're born and do everything we can to optimize health prior to conception because the benefits on your future grandchildren is are going to be huge. And so again, I say, if you have time, because you don't wanna be, if you can control it, you don't wanna be smack dab in the middle of like a detoxification and then get pregnant. You wanna kind of wrap that up, then give yourself a few months and then get pregnant. So yeah, that's, what that's I got. great advice. And I think, you know, we, we like to focus a lot on the mom, but I think the fathers can do all of this too. You oh know, my gosh. Yeah. They're contributing as well. So moms out there <laughs> or future moms to be, don't just take this all on you. Do this as a household, involve your parents, involve your siblings, involve everyone else in your life, because why not? They can get healthier along the way. And even though it may not directly impact the child, like the two parents will, it, it will make a difference. So the more you can involve your village again, the better off you'll be and the easier the whole process will be because you won't be fighting the uphill battle with everybody around you who's not on the same page. They'll all be with you. Totally. Can I add one bonus postpartum? Of course. <laughs> I just thought of it. And it's so important. If you've recently had a baby, get outside every day. That is like, it seems so small and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that really going to do? But it is so important because you can just get sucked into a bubble in your house and like never see the light of day again for like many months. You have to get outside. You have to breathe fresh air. If you can go for a walk, even better. But also getting that sunlight in your eyeballs is going to signal to your pineal gland to start producing hormones. And one of those being melatonin, which will then get activated at darkness to help your sleep. And you don't get that from like your light bulb in your house. So get outside every day. You don't have to go for a walk, but just get outside, breathe some fresh air and get some light in your eyeballs. Obviously yes. don't look directly at the sun, but right. I love that advice. And I would say that's true for all of us, not just yeah. if you are pregnant or want to get pregnant or just had a baby. All people need to get outside and see the sun directly every day, totally. <laughs> even on cloudy days, even on cold days, every day. <laughs> that's right. I think that's great advice. So if people are interested in your work or they want to learn more about what you do or more about your story, where can they find you? I am at pivotalorigins.com. I am also on 
Instagram at Pivotal Origins. And um, I have, I will give a, I have a free guide that is um, seven evidence-based reasons for your never-ending postpartum symptoms. And I will give that as well. And it really goes into things like constipation, anxiety, joint pain, hair loss, all the things. So I think that that will be extremely um, valuable and helpful to a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. We will definitely link up all of that in the description for this episode. So anyone can just quickly click and get there. So thank you so much for sharing your story and all of the things that you went through and just your valuable tips for everybody out there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And to everyone out there, we'll catch you again on future episodes. Be well. Thanks for being a faithful listener to the podcast. I'd love it if you left me a five-star review on this podcast so that others can more easily find this valuable information. Did you know I also work one-on-one with clients? I approach solving health challenges like I approached solving crimes by conducting a thorough investigation into your case. Sadly, hundreds of millions of people in the U.S. have insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, and diabetes, and the vast majority have no idea. I'm here to fix that. If you struggle with low energy, stubborn weight, hypertension, sleep disturbances, or any other undesired symptoms, let's talk. All you have to do is schedule a free call. The link will be in the show notes. And no, you do not need to live near me. 